Uh, I am Pastor Joel. Pastor Mike is away spending some time with his family, and so I am the youth pastor here at West Florida, and I have the great opportunity to be able to preach for you today. An awesome story. What better story to be able to preach from than the story of David and Goliath? Because it's probably one of the the most common stories, I mean, the world knows the story of David and Goliath. I mean, it's seen all throughout our culture. You hear references to David and Goliath in sports, in politics. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. And so I'm really excited to learn some lessons from this passage of Scripture. This message is actually uh, the second part to a two-part message that I was able to um, give to our students here at WFBA. And the th- The topic of those two messages was dealing with uh, things in our life that we just seem to struggle with and can't get rid of. And the idea was these these are giants in our life. A a word that we would use, a Bible word, would be something like a habitual sin, a sin that just keeps coming up over and over and over again. Uh, Another word that we might use today uh, that's maybe a little more mainstream is an addiction, It's something that we're addicted to. Now, we can be addicted to all sorts of things, right? We can be addicted to good things. We can be addicted to reading our Bible, amen, right? I'm addicted to reading my Bible and and getting something from God's word every single day. Um, Addiction can be defined like this. It's something that, um, addiction can be defined simply as this. Anything that we cannot live without, Right? So like I said, we can be addicted to something that's good for us, right? Eating healthy, uh, reading our Bible, uh, spending time in prayer. Man, I just can't go through my day without these things. But we can also be addicted to things that are destructive behaviors. These aren't necessarily sins. They're just not useful to us. Scrolling too long on our phones, watching too much TV, stressing about the news that's happening you know, the, around the world. And these are destructive behaviors to us. But then we can also be addicted to habitual sins and evil desires and things that we try to get out of our life. And and so that's what these two uh, messages were designed to deal with. And, And I'm giving you the second part of these. So it's kind of the conclusion of it. But whatever our addiction is, whatever our, the thing that we go back to over and over again, the things that we're going to be talking about today is mostly those last two, those, those, those destructive behaviors and those habitual sins. And hopefully my prayer is that we would see from the Bible how we can deal with these giants in our life. Before we go into discussing the giants that we do face and and where they come from, there's two main premises from the story of David and Goliath that I wanna bring to your attention that maybe you've never thought of before. First of all, in the story of David and Goliath, I want you to understand this. David was not motivated by his own safety or freedom to slay the giant. Have you ever thought about that before? What do you mean? Well, look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 26. It says this, and David, this is when he comes before uh, the host of the Philistines with the Israelites. They're all camped up there. David spake unto the men that stood by him, saying... What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? We read on further when when David is standing before the Philistine, what does David say to the Philistine in verse number 45? Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and, and with a spear and with a shield, but I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thy head from thee, and I will give the, the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all, get this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and with the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give thee into my hand. What was David's motivation for conquering the giants in his life? It wasn't to bring himself any type of freedom. It was the glory of God's name. That's what was at stake. David did these things not because of fear or bondage. He was motivated by the glory of God and the fame of his name. Earlier in the story, uh, David gives credit to slaying a bear and a lion. And he gives the, the glory to God. He gives the credit to God. 
he realizes that the battle is the Lord's and he will give him the strength, the same strength to conquer this giant. When you face the giants in your life, understand that God's glory is at stake, friends. These habitual sins, these destructive behaviors, God's glory is at stake here. You must make the connection between your personal freedom and God's glory. They are linked together. We live honestly, in a very self-centered world. We live in a self-centered world that focuses on ourselves. And, and, and sometimes we view our relationship with God like this. We often pray prayers like this. God, would you change me? God, would you deliver me? God, help me. God, give me. God, save me. And it's all about us. We let our self-centered world come into our relationship with God, and our prayers are focused on me rather than the glory of God. Let me ask you just, I mean, we're just like not even five minutes into the message, but let me ask you a really convicting and appointed question. Is God getting glory in your life right now? Or is there a giant standing on your throat? And because he's there, no one is able to see the glory of God in your life because you're dealing with this giant and he's got you down. God's glory is at stake. That's the first premise here from the story of David and Goliath. The motivation to fight these giants, to get victory over this sin, to get victory over these um, destructive behaviors, the motivation has to be not because I want to be free, but because God needs the glory. The second thing that I need you to understand from this story is that you are not David in the story. What? I've always heard that I was David in the story. I've always identified with David in the story, right? I mean, David is a young man who, who goes and wins a victory for the Lord. I'm a young man who, who wants to win and live a victorious life for God. And I want to do that, and I want to identify with David in the story, I, but ever, I, can, I, I just, I cannot. I, um, often I look at this story and I think, okay, I've got to pick myself up, I've got to grab my sling, I've got to grab my five stones, and I need to go and slay the giants in my life. I want you to see today, as we get into dealing with these giants, that you're not David in the story. We're more like the Israelites hiding in the corner who needs someone to come in and fight the battle for us. We need someone to come in and slay the giants. I present to you today that Jesus is the giant slayer of sin in our life. He's the one who came and won the victory over sin and death and the grave. We just sang all about it, about how his love is poured out to us. Behold the God who has done all these things for us. Man, this Jesus is the giant slayer in our life. This is not a story about how you need to try harder. This is not a message about how you need to get up and you need to fight those giants. I've been there before. And every single time I try to fight giants in my own strength, I fail. I cannot rely on my own strength to, to overcome life's challenges. I must be dependent on the work of God, what he has already done in my life, to overcome life's challenges. It's not about trying harder to break an addiction. I need an addiction killer in my life. And his name is Jesus. Jesus goes out to fight for me, and he cuts the head off of my enemy. Goliath must fall. The giants in our life must be destroyed because God's glory is at stake, and he must be seen as the giant slayer in our life. So if Jesus slays the giants, where do they come from? Where do these giants, why do they keep coming back? If he has already won the victory, why do I still live as if there's a giant standing on my throat? In other words, why do I keep doing the things that I do? Here's what I believe. I believe that the destructive behaviors, the habitual sins in our life, are not the root of the problem. The giant is there, but where do they come from? I believe that these, these actions, these are behaviors and symptoms of greater issues in our hearts. Those things that we face daily, it's because of a heart condition. And I believe that the, at the root of many of our addictions, we're going to see today, there are four things in our hearts, greater deadly giants, if you will, in your hearts that Jesus has already conquered, he's already defeated, but they can still be so deadly in our lives, friends. So where do giants come from? Where do they come from? I believe they, first of all, come from a heart 
of fear, a heart of fear. Look back at 1 Samuel with me. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we read the verse together. It was the last verse that we read in, in verse number 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Fear cripples the believer. It cripples the believer from accomplishing anything great for, for God. The Bible calls this the spirit of fear. 2 Timothy verse, or chapter 1 says this, Wherefore, I put you in remembrance, Timothy, that you stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. God has not given us this spirit of fear. Fear is a place, it, it, fear, the spirit of fear. Now, there are things that you should be afraid of, right? There, uh, there's a healthy fear, but this spirit of fear is this, this uh, unwillingness to act for God because you're unsure of what will happen and you're not trusting God, right? And, and fear can, we can be afraid of all sorts of different things. We can be afraid of the repercussions, that if I deal with this giant, if I deal with this heart issue, if I let people know that I'm struggling, Pastor Joel, you don't understand the repercussions of that. And honestly, I'm just too scared that people will find out who I really am on the inside and they won't like me. We can be afraid of the, the, the repercussions of if I do this, if I do what God is calling me to do at my workplace, and if I stand up and I'm a light for him where I'm, supposed to, where I'm supposed to be, I'm afraid that people at my workplace won't like me. We get afraid of the repercussions for slaying the giants in our, in our, or dealing with those heart issues so that Jesus can be glorified. We're afraid of repercussions. We're afraid of, this is a big one, losing control. If I let go of this thing, then I have no more control over it. I'm afraid of losing control over my, over my kids, losing control over my, my finances, losing control. If I, if I tithe, if I give money to God, what, I'm going to lose control over what I have. And God says it was never in your control anyway. I'm the one who, who blesses you. I'm the one who gives you life and gives you the ability to go to work and do these things. Oftentimes, we're afraid to, to kill that giant in our life or to stand out in, in victory over that giant because we're afraid of losing control. I think that this is a big one for us, and I just alluded to it a minute ago, but we're afraid of being exposed. We're fearful of being exposed of who we really are on the inside. Pastor Joel, if I told people what I really struggled with, I, people would turn away from me. They wouldn't like me. If people knew what I really was dealing with in my heart, it would, be, it would be devastating to my family. We're afraid of being exposed, but here's the beautiful thing. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 13, it says this about God. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto his eyes, the eyes of him who, whom we have to do. The one whom we have to do with, the one who really matters, who, whose opinion of you really matters, already knows. Already knows. You've already been exposed before him. But here's the beautiful thing. He died for that in your life. He died for that. He loves you enough to deal with that issue. He knows who you really are. And while you are still in your sin, he died for you. He loved you. That, that's the exposure that we're afraid of. If people knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. God knows who you are, and he loves you. And he wants to deal with that issue in your life. He doesn't want you to continue in that destructive behavior or that habitual sin. Fear, friends, is faith in the enemy. Fear is faith in the enemy. We must reverse this and place our faith in God. We can't have faith in the enemy that he's gonna win, that I'm gonna lose control. God is in control. Do you have enough faith in God to deal with this issue in your life? I love what David said in Psalm 3. Lord, he says this in Psalm 3, verse one. He says this, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be that say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. I mean, everybody just says, he's gonna, he's gonna have a hard road and there's no hope for him. But then he says this in verse number three, 
but thou, O Lord, art my shield, uh, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down to sleep. I laid me down and I slept. I wonder, those fearful friends, those of you who are living in fear, being exposed, losing control, the repercussions, when was the last time you truly slept and rested in God? And the verse goes on. He says, I slept and I waked for the Lord sustained me. Fear is faith in the enemy. We must place our faith in God in order to deal with the fear that's in our heart that brings those giants before us so often. So where do giants come from? I believe, first of all, they come from a heart of fear. We see that of of the children of Israel and Saul in this story, just so fearful, unwilling to act and fight the giant in their life. I believe that giants also come from a place of rejection. Rejection. What do you mean by this, Pastor Joel? Well, in 1 Samuel, back to 1 Samuel 17, verse number 33. And uh, this is Saul speaking to David. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. You know, at this point, David had a choice to believe what other people thought about him or believe in the God who called him to do this work. He could believe in what other people thought about him, how weak he was, how young he was, all of these things about him, and they rejected him and pushed him aside as just a little shepherd boy who's not able to do anything great for God. He could believe those lies, or he could believe what God called him to do and believe in the God who is the giant slayer, who had enabled him to do all the things before in his life to slay the bear and to slay the lion, who had given him the strength to be able to do that. He could believe that God. To help you understand, I I was trying to think of a personal story of rejection to help you understand the idea here. Someone who's who's close to me, who I've known a long time, um, I've just been kind of watching their life, and I'm not going to say who it is just to kind of protect the person, but I've been kind of watching their life, and and they, I've just noticed, when I first met them, they were really on, like, fire for God. They were doing things. They were leading their family. I thought, man, this person really loves God and is leading well. But then as I've I've got to know them and years have gone by, I've just kind of noticed a turning away. It's kind of like a, I'm just, uh, I'm not really into that anymore and not really focused on leading his family and, and, and studying the Bible like he did. And recently, I confronted him about it. He was this close person, and I just asked him, I said, hey, um, you know, when I first met you, I really noticed that you, you loved God, and you were serious about these things. And I asked you your salvation testimony, and you told me, and man, I, I, be, I, believe that, I believe that you're saved, man. That's such a strong salvation testimony, and I believe it, but man, you're not living like it right now. You're really in, into a lot of things that I don't think you should be into, and, and you're really struggling. And I just remember what he told me. He said, you know, Joel, I used to care about all those things. I really did. But every time I would try to lead my family, every time I would try to make a decision, his wife, who I also know well, would always respond back to him. She had a Bible degree. She had studied a lot of scripture and she had responded. Every time he would try to make a decision to lead his family, let's go to this church, let's read this book, let's study this together, uh, let's do this. He respond, this is what he told me. Every time I would try to do that, she would respond and say, well, that's not quite right. That's not quite right. Let's, let's change it up. And constantly, her just rejection of his leadership, this is what he told me. I used to try to do that, but every time she would say, well, that's not quite right, so I just gave up, stopped trying. And I've watched this person just spiral down. And I'm, I'm working, I'm praying for this person, and I'm, I'm working with this person and hoping that something will awaken in his heart and he'll, he'll deal with this heart of rejection that just over and over again, someone who's supposed to be supportive, someone who's supposed to be loving, someone who's supposed to be a, a help me, just constantly chopping him down. And I wonder how many times we go through our life 
And there's people in our life who, who are supposed to be our cheerleaders, who are supposed to point us to God, who are supposed to be there for us and support us and, and challenge us and, and love us and, and point us to God, don't. And they fail because people fail. And the rejection, just after rejection after rejection, leads us to a place where we just don't care anymore. We stop trying. David chose here not to believe what other people were saying about him. The Bible, this is, by the way, this is the difference between religion and faith. Religion is this idea that I'm going to do these things so that I get approval from God. Faith in God is because God has given me approval and he has saved me, I'm going to do these things for him. The Bible says this in 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, we just learned about this word, behold. Behold, we ought to listen, we ought to pay attention. We have to stop believing what other people say about us and listen to what God says about us. I love how John describes this. You can sense the passion in the way that he's trying to get his readers to understand. He says, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Can you imagine? We are his children. We are loved by him. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We don't even fully grasp the joys and, and the wonder of being called his child. We don't, it doesn't fully appear to us yet. We don't know the riches and the glory of what it means to be a child of God fully yet. We will when we enter into heaven, when we enter into glory. We, don't, we haven't seen the joys yet. He says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There are so many joys and blessings in being a child of God. This is the joy. Behold the love of God. Maybe you've been rejected before. Maybe this person who, who should have loved you rejected you. Listen, if we live by man's approval... It's been said that we will die by man's rejection. We cannot live in this place of rejection, and we ought to believe what God says about us, not what these other people are saying about us. I believe the giants in our life, they come from a place of a heart of fear and not trusting God. I believe that the giants in our life come from a place of rejection, a heart of rejection. This next one here is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Uh, a hobby horse, if you will. I believe that the giants in our life come from a place of comfort or complacency. Comfort or complacency. Listen to the verse here, and I hope that you are gonna see what I see here. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 16, it says this, and the Philistines drew near morning and evening, and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself, how many days, everyone? 40 days, 40 days. Do you know how long 40 days is? It's 40 days, okay? It's longer than a month. That's a long time. 40 days is a long time. Over and over and over again, this, go, this giant gets up and he's like, I defy the, the armies of the living God. And just over and over and over again. And pretty soon, um, you've heard of the, like, the diets that you take, right? It's like 21 day fix. And this like, takes 21 days or 30 days to build this habit. I think that the children of Israel are just kind of getting used to this big lumbering giant coming out and defying the armies of the living God. And they just kind of get complacent with it. And David shows up and he's looking at all the Israelites and they're making their lattes at their campfires and they're just getting so used to seeing this. They're like, I don't know, he's just there. And we get so used to the giants in our life that we don't deal with them. I think that the giants in our life, why they come up over and over and over again and why Jesus, the giant slayer in our life who died for our sins, and then we, we get comfortable and complacent in the place of our sin. James puts it this way, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Friends, we do Satan's job for him, the great deceiver, when we hear God's word over and over again. We know what we're supposed to do, but we don't do it. James goes on. I love the book of James. James goes on in James chapter 2. He says this, what doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith alone save him? Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The The devils also believe and tremble. 
But wilt thou know, O vain man? Vain means just worthless, pointless. Will you know, O pointless man? Your faith is just pointless. That faith without works, it's dead faith. Dead faith. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's not accomplishing what it's supposed to do. Think about anyone in scripture who truly did anything great for God that had an easy life. Can you think of any? Uh, See, our faith grows in uncomfortable situations. Our faith grows most in uncomfortable situations, and we have to get out of our comfort. I, I heard a comedian one time tell a story about, uh, about how out of shape he was, and I thought it was, was really funny. He said, I knew I was out of shape when I was watching a football game, and in the time that it took me to walk from my couch to my fridge and grab a, a, a drink and walk back to my couch, a man ran 100 yards across the football field. And he had 12 men who were highly trained to try to stop him. I just had an ottoman in my way. Like, we we sit and we watch other people achieve. We watch other people live out their faith. We sit in in our church services and we listen to pastors preach. We go to our Bible studies and we hear about other people winning and fighting the battles in in their life. We sit in our connect groups. We go to our Bible studies, our prayer meetings, and we talk about others facing giants. When will you believe enough to get up out of your chair and to go and face the giants in our life that are defying the God whom you claim to serve. We cannot sit idly by and become spiritually obese, sitting in our church pews, letting pastors feed us the word of God and not living it out. We must exercise our faith. I think so often we just get comfortable with where we are. We get into a place of comfort and complacency like the children of Israel for 40 days. The enemy came before them. They're like, there he is again. (sniffs) Hope someone does something. Get up. Do something. Where do giants come from? They come from a place of fear. They come from a place of rejection. They come from a place of complacency, or comfort, last of all, probably one of the most important ones for us to deal with because I think it's so true to our hearts. I think giants come from a place of anger, or a better word might be bitterness. First Samuel, this is interesting. I didn't, as I was studying through this passage, I never really like understood what was going on here until I was just kind of reading more about David's life. In First Samuel chapter 17, 28, David is asking all the people all these questions. You know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And his brother, the eldest, Eliab, the eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. His anger was just, he was mad at David. Why was he so mad at David? And he said unto him, why comest thou down hither? And with, with, with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? See, he's like belittling David. Those few sheep. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down, that thou mayest see the battle. And David responds and says, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? You know, I never really focused on Eliab's anger here. But why was Eliab so angry and bitter towards David? Well, you remember the story, right? Where, where Samuel comes into David's home. Jesse is his father. And he says, well, I'm here to anoint the next king of Israel. And, and Samuel lines up all of his sons. And Eliab, probably the eldest, probably is thinking, I'm probably going to be the one who is chosen to be the king because I'm the oldest. And Samuel looks at him and he's like, mm, not you. What? Not me? I'm the oldest. I'm, I run this household. And then he goes to the next, well, okay, fine. Maybe it's my next brother. He goes through all of his brothers and he's like, it's none of them. Do you have any others? And Jesse's like, yeah, I have a worthless son who's out watching the sheep. You want him? Yeah, bring him in. He comes in and he anoints him. And Eliab is sitting over here like, that's supposed to be me. Why did Eliab, the eldest of Jesse's son, not go out and face the giant? he's dealing with some bitterness and anger in his heart it's just boiling up he's not dealing with it 
I think giants come up in our life over and over again because of the bitterness and the anger in our heart. James, I love the book of James. I told you that already. But James chapter one says this. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to, what's the next word? Wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And how are you going to deal with the wrath? How are you going to deal with the anger and the bitterness? He says this, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Friends, when it comes to dealing with With wrath and bitterness, your soul is at stake. The heart, the the health of your soul is at stake when it comes to your bitterness. Your soul is at stake. And so you must receive with meekness the engrafted word of God. And when you do this, when you receive with meekness the word of God, you'll read verses like Romans chapter 3, verse 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. And there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And you're able to focus on your own sin and imperfections. And that helps you learn to forgive others. You know what? I have gone out of the way. I have defied God, and I need forgiveness. And you're able to focus, when you receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, you're able to understand that you have your own sin, and you're not perfect yourself. When you receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, you read verses like Romans chapter 12, that say this, recompense no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him to drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. You want to get your enemy to think about who's really in charge or who God is? Be kind to them. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. When you receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, you're you're gonna be able to focus on your own sin and your own imperfections, but you also let God be the avenger of the wrong. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. When with meekness you say, you know what? I'm not the avenger here. I'm gonna let God deal with this. I'm gonna let him avenge the wrong. When you receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, you'll read passages like Romans chapter five, verse number eight. But God commendeth his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you'll learn to forgive. You'll learn to forgive. By the way, no one deserves forgiveness. They wronged you. They don't deserve your forgiveness. No one deserves it. But neither do you. You don't deserve forgiveness either. Justice demands a a penalty. Justice demands a punishment. But Ephesians says this, be ye kind one to another, one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. The basis for my forgiveness is not off of what the offender has done for me but it's on the forgiver. That's the basis of my forgiveness is because I have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. That's why I forgive, out of worship to him. Where do giants come from? They come from a place of fear. They come from a place of rejection. They come from a place of comfort and complacency and anger and bitterness. Friends, If you don't rely on God to deal with these issues in your heart, you'll constantly be living like there's a giant that's standing on you, holding you down, and you will not be bringing God glory with your life. We have to let God's word, the engrafted word, come into our life and deal with these issues of anger, deal with these issues of fear, deal with these issues of rejection and bitterness. We must use the word of God to deal with the issues in our hearts so that we can bring God, Jesus Christ, the giant slayer in our life, we can bring him the glory. His name, the glory of his name is at stake. 